Hi, good evening, everyone. It's seven o'clock on October 6, 2022. And I call the Cupertino Parks and the Recreation Commission meeting to order. Uh, okay, let's start with the roll call, please. All right, Commissioner Swami. Present. Commissioner Stanek. Here. Commissioner Kumarapan. Here. And Chair Shu. Here. And right now we just have Vice Chair Begor absent. Okay. So, uh, the next one is, uh, is there, we need to approve the meeting minutes. Next, I'm checking. There are ceremonial matters. Oh, but that, before that, that's a ceremony and presentation. Okay. That's a, so the agenda item one is a parks and recreation department summer program and events. Thank you, Chair. So I'd like to introduce Sonia Lee and Jenny Coverman. Um, they will be doing the presentation for our summer programs and events. Thanks, Rochelle. Yep. Um, good evening, Chair Shu and Commissioners. We're here tonight to provide a recap of our summer programs and our agenda for this evening. We have the Blackberry Farm season update, our summer programs and camps, summer events and festivals, as well as our upcoming events. So our Blackberry Farm swimming reservations, we made several changes to our drop-in swim program at Blackberry Farm this year. We updated the weekday hours to accommodate our Learn to Swim program, opening at noon instead of 10. And in response to the pandemic and patron and staff safety, we required reservations for one hour and 45 minute swim blocks. On weekdays, there were three swim blocks and on weekends, we had five. Each block was capped at 75 people which helped ensure social distancing in the water as well as on the grass. And in general, we received positive feedback from guests about the swim blocks. Many people expressed how, safely they how safe they felt in the facility. And all things being considered, our numbers were really pretty good this year. We had over 11,700 swimmers with a residency rate of 44%. Um, for reference, back in 2019, before the pandemic, we were at just about 12,000 swimmers with a 40% residency rate. Next slide, Jess, thanks. Um, this is our second year of holding our Learn to Swim program at Blackberry Farm. Historically, the program has been held at one of our local high schools and we had to rent the pool from the high schools, which typically cost us between 25 to $30,000. Due to the cost and the increasingly limited availability of time that we could get at the school pools, we moved the program to Blackberry Farm. And this move gives us the added advantage of the ability to use lifeguards for both swim lessons and recreation swim at the same location, which has provided, which has been um, really beneficial to us. Our youth classes were private, our adult classes and our parent child water introduction classes were semi private. And we continue to offer the option for adaptive needs lessons as we have in years past. We had over 240 lessons that we offered this summer. And our favorite pooch plunge was held on September 10th. Um, we started out offering three block, three 45 minute blocks of time with a maximum capacity of 40 in each block. However, due to the significant amount of interest in the event, we added a fourth block and um, raised the total, the capacity in each one to 50. We had a total of 195 registered this summer, which nearly doubled our total um, from last year. And finally, our picnic reservations at Blackberry Farm this summer, we had 146 reservations with a residency rate of 60%, which was really good for us. Um, we've never seen the residency rate that high before. Typically it's between 40 to 50%. We also reserved picnic sites at Linda Vista, Portal Park and Memorial Park. And we had 75 reservations total for the, between those three sites. 
And now I'm going to turn it over the presentation to our recreation manager, Sonia Lee, who's going to discuss the remainder of our summer programs. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for having me. Um, Jenny gets the fun dogs. I'm going to continue on with the summer programs um, and camps. Wanted to start with our contractual camps and classes. These are all the programs that we offer during the summer at Quinlan Community Center and in our park buildings, such as Monta Vista. Um, we offer a variety of special interest camp camps and classes, um, things such as Legos, robotics, origami, cooking, art, science. Um, all of these programs are offered through about 30 different contractors. And um, we have several different contractors such as Snapology, Mad Science, UFRAT Museum of Art, Junior Chef Stars, just to give you an idea of a few. Um, this last summer, our total participants in these camps and classes were, was 1,245. Okay, moving on to our sports camps and classes, which is actually Jenny's area, but I'll do those for tonight. Um, a large portion of our sports and fitness programs are offered at the sports center, um, where we offer tennis, fitness, pickleball, basketball, and badminton. Um, but our primary contractor there is Lifetime Fitness. We also offer camps and classes on the fields, and um, those are through contractors such as Skyhawks. And Monta Vista has our gymnastics facility, which is um, contracted with Bay Area um, Gymnastics. Um, this last summer, our total participants in sports camps and classes was 2,024. Okay, hey, moving on to our littlest campers. Um, our staff actually coordinates our preschool adventures camp, and that's a camp at Quinlan Preschool um, for little guys that are aged three to five. Um, it's run by our year-round preschool teachers, and it gives um, campers a chance to do arts and crafts and music for four days and to prepare for preschool coming up in the fall. Um, this last summer, we had 142 um, preschoolers in Adventures Camp. Camp Cupertino, that's another one run by our recreation leaders. And um, this year we had it at Memorial Field and it was nine weeks. This is run by our Cupertino recreation leaders with the help of our leaders in training. Um, it's a fun traditional camp with um, crafts and lots of group games. Um, for ages six through 11. And um, this last summer we had 274 kids in the program. For those kids who love science and nature, we have opportunities out at McClellan Ranch Preserve and the um, Environmental Education Center. Um, we had alternating weeks, June 13th to August 5th. And those campers got to explore nature out at the preserve and to utilize the Environmental Education Center for the camps. Um, this last summer, we had 153 kids in the program. All of these camps that are run by our recreation leaders um, have the assistance of our leaders in training or our LITs. And this is a wonderful um, team summer volunteer opportunity that's run with our um, team coordinator for kids ages 14 to 18. Um, they get to work with our recreation leaders and learn valuable skills that prepare them to then become part-time employees with us. Um, this last year we had 32 LITs in the program. Okay, we're gonna move on to summer events and festivals. We did more. <laughs> we'll start off our first event was um, 4th of July. Um, in the morning, we had several different activities um, for everyone. The um, Optimist Club hosted a pancake breakfast with about 300 people that um, registered for that. Um, Onward in the morning at Memorial Park, we had several different things. We had the flag raising at our memorial. Um, we had a children's parade from the memorial over to the concert and then a concert for the morning, um, along with several different children's activities, such as a bouncy house and crafts and fun things to celebrate the day. Um, we estimated about um, 1,200 for the um, Memorial Park activities. Um, then 
onward through the day, they were able to um, go swimming at Blackberry Farm. And then into the evening, we hosted a fireworks show at um, Hyde Middle Schools where we set off the fireworks with viewing sites at Creekside Park, Sedgwick Elementary, and Miller Avenue. We estimated our attendance across um, all those sites to be around 6,000. Okay, our summer concert series. Um, in June and July, we had five different concert nights at the amphitheater with some super fun ba bands. I know I saw some of you out there on those nights. And um, we estimated our attendance to be about two to 300 for each of the evenings. Cupertino Campout, one of my favorites. Um, this one return, what this was, was an opportunity for families to come out from um, July 23rd to the 24th. They actually set up their tents out on um, Creekside Park Field, and our staff was there to assist. We showed a movie. You can see that they had s'mores, and we had a um, scout group out there helping um, families to set up their tents. Um, it was amazing how many people were really excited to set up a tent for the first time in camp with their family and they appreciated the assistance. Um, and then also McCullen Ranch Preserve brought some of the animals out so that the kids could enjoy um, getting to interact with the animals. Um, this last year we had 190 campers in the program. Shakespeare in the Park, we, um, we do contract with Shakespeare in the Park to provide eight nights of show with this year's show being much to do about nothing. Um, they estimated their average attendance per show this year was 250. Still more we're doing here, um, movies in the park. Our staff um, hosted our movies in the park and we had um, four different nights of family friendly movies where we set up our inflatable screen and people came out to enjoy um, the movie. You can see them there on their blankets and snacks and just really having fun as a family. We estimated our attendance this last year to be about 200 per movie, some more, some less. Bobatino on um, Saturday, September 17th from noon to 3 p.m. We had about 270 teens that um, signed up to enjoy an afternoon with their friends, relaxing with free boba and participating in um, some of our mobile recreation activities and collect, um, connecting with local mental health resources and community partners. Um, it was a great day. And I know looking at um, some of the feedback that we received from the teens, Every single one of them, we love boba. We like the boba. The boba was great. So <laughs> it was very popular um, and boba was the right thing to serve. <laughs> and just recently in September, we have um, worked with some of our community partners to um, have two festivals. On September 10th, we had Dilly Hot. Um, and then on September 24th, we had the Silicon Valley Day and Night Fun Fest um, hosted by Rotary. Um, those were great fun and we also work with them as liaisons to make sure that um, everything goes well for the day um, at our facilities. Both were held at the Memorial Park Field. Upcoming events, we're not done. <laughs> we still have more to go. Um, we are in process right now, um, right out on the field right now. They're setting up for Diwali, which is coming up this Saturday, um, October 8th from 11 to 6 at Memorial Park. And the Chamber of Commerce, Commerce will be hosting the Diwali Festival. Um, this is a festival of lights and the festival showcases a wide array of multicultural music, dance, art, and food. Um, admission is free for this festival. Next step, we'll have pizza and politics on October 21st from 6.30 to 8.30 um, p.m. at Community Hall. Um, and this is a chance for um, local teens to eat pizza and connect with local politicians to discuss local political issues that might affect them with pizza and politics. Um, this one, advanced registration is required. Uh, after that, we'll have October 22nd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., which is a Saturday at Blackberry Farm. Um, city staff will host our Wildlife and Harvest Day Festival to celebrate the harvest season and learn about local birds, nature, ecology, and wildlife. Admission is free for this event. 
Next step will be on October 27th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Senior Center, we'll have hidden treasures where hundreds of knickknacks, jewelry, household items, and um, more are all sold. The proceeds from the sales go to our Cupertino Senior Center's Stay Active Fund, and this event um, ensures that the event realizes the goal of seniors in helping seniors. And last step is Monster Mash. It's gonna be a really fun one. We have some cute pictures from last year. Um, this will be on October 28th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. at Quinlan Community Center, right in the back of our um, community center. We're gonna have Monster Mash. Um, we're excited and there's lots of planning going on for um, making this a super fun, cute event for parents and children, um, children 12 years old and under, and we'll have games, spooky crafts, trick-or-treating, and registration will be required for that event. That concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Do I have any questions? Wow, great, great presentation. Yeah, a lot of wonderful program, <laughs> looks a lot of fun. So, is there any clarification question from Commissioner? Let me check. Uh, okay. So, yeah, Commissioner Kumara Pan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, no question, but a comment. Can I make the comment or I need to wait for the next session? Oh, if it's a short comment, I think oh, it's yeah, okay. a very quick comment. It's, it's fantastic to see all of them. One request would be, is there a, maybe it's a question, is there a way that all the numbers you shared, which is absolutely stunning, like 1,000, 2,000 after the pandemic, all of them are coming. And is there a way to share those numbers as well? Because this is a public information, right? These slides. Uh, I would love to see that the public see these numbers of participation and they get excited too. So that's a is there a way they can find out? Or if you could remember, because when you were talking about it, Sanya, so I, I looked at, oh my God, 1,000, and then sports are on 2,000 plus, there's people, and now you had registration, all of them are, which is overwhelming response for all the programs. i like to see, is there a way we can put that one so that it goes to public records and people see it. Today, just a presentation of this a public record. So that's one. The second one, it's a long time which I was asking. I know Rachel may be knowing that you, all the boba things you all talk about, I said, can we also be participating? But it's only for teams. And just, I'm I'm still not happy that I'm, we are not allowed, but just putting that. I know it's a very famous one, but I just want to put that. Come on, that's it. But thank you, it was fantastic overall. You're welcome. Okay, so the next, oh, the our vice chair, Sashi Bego is online. Yeah, I, I pretty much came in just as soon as Jenny started. So uh, thanks, uh, Jenny and Sonia, for that wonderful presentation. That's a lot, a lot of work. Um, I, Gopal stole my question, one part of it, <laughs> um, which is basically, yeah, numbers people, right? You put engineers in front of anything, they'll go, okay, <laughs> how many of this and how many of that? So yeah, we'd like to see that on the slide. It's very boring. Your pictures are far more interesting to see, but <laughs> nice for the, for the people who may be saying to actually see the numbers and trying to remember. Um, the other follow-on question to that is, you know, uh, we've got some ex exciting numbers. I wrote down one, which was 1245 for the arts and crafts and 2024 for the, for the sports stuff. Um, is there a percentage increase that happened or a decrease that happened from previous years? I mean, obviously we won't be 2020 into consideration or maybe even 2021, but if you do 19 and ahead, is there, um, have we come back to normal? Do you have a perspective? You want to take that one, Michelle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Sonia has been with us for almost a, almost a year now. We're, we're hitting that year mark pretty soon. Um, but we have seen that things are coming back. There are a number of things that we're doing great on and then a number of things that are still taking some time to get people back in. Um, so we're slowly ramping up with different opportunities. We're going to try and get through this year and then probably even take into consideration next year to see if it's 
do we just not need to offer some of these things anymore and we need to look at something new or is it just that people are still getting comfortable coming in? But um, kind of like Jenny said in the beginning, I mean, there's some things that are ramped all the way back up. No problem. People are happy to be there or like Pooch Plunge that doubled in, you know, the, the amount of people that were there. Um, but so it's just really about continuing in recreation to pay attention to your community and what, you know, the different trends are. Okay, so if there's any... Oh, Sashi, you're muted if you were. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I didn't want the noise to go on, so I muted and forgot to turn it back off. Um, so I guess the answer would be that we, we, in some respects, we're coming back, but we don't have the full numbers of where we are. Okay. All right. That's, that's all I had. That's all I had. Everything else can wait. Okay. So if there's no more clarification question, we can just... Can I ask one question? Sure. Yeah. Thank, you, <laughs> Thank you, Jeshu. Thank you, Um, You know, these are a huge number of uh, activities, and I know that you all do a fabulous job of, uh, of uh, sending out parks and recreation booklet. Is there a way in which uh, the citizens of, uh, or the residents of Cupertino can uh, register through email and uh, have this show up on their inbox? You mean get it actually sent to them in the email? Exactly. For example, Shakespeare in the Park, um, all these different activities. You see, there are not too many people these days that are actually opening the physical thing. And even if they get that, it might not be top of mind. But if this shows up in people's uh, inboxes or calendars, if they want to accept it, it's there. And maybe we can get more uh, participation. Uh, and that is probably going to be, ex I mean, uh, you might get more participation. It's not that you're getting, um, people are probably actively not uh, uh, joining because they might forget it or they might, it might not be top of mind or it might not be something they've actually saved in their online calendars. Is that something we can consider going forward? So we actually already have that opportunity within Cupertino. If you go to cupertino.org at the very top, you, there's e-notification. There is a page where you can put in your email address and click on anything citywide that you would like to know about. And so you know, events are on there, different yeah. McCullen Ranch is on there. So anything you click, if we send out an e-blast about it, which we send e-blasts about almost everything these days, you will get it in your email. Yeah, I, I'm not talking about myself as a commissioner, but I'm really talking about how many residents of uh, Cupertino have actually registered their email addresses. Uh, it depends on which thing it is, because everything is different. You can choose what you want information on, but we have up to four to six thousand people on some of them okay okay so there is a potential opportunity for more people to get on i wonder how many of them really know about it but that's a good point if you find the secret to getting out to all sixty thousand people <laughs> i would love to know it <laughs> yeah yeah it may be a consideration that we put it on the top of the booklet itself, uh, recreations or activities register or something in the front. Just thinking out loud here, I'm not saying that that should be what you need to do. And that is just so you know, on almost every page of the booklet are regforrec.org, which is where you can go to register for any of our classes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if there's no more clarification question, we just go to the public comments session. And I saw a community member raised hand. Okay, so in each one of community member can have three minutes to talk. Uh, Carol Ma, yeah, you can speak. Uh, hello? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Oh, so for uh, full transparency, I just wanted to let everybody know that I'm also uh, a commissioner on the Arts and Culture Commission. Um, so I just uh, wanted to say thank you for letting me just kind of jump in in this call. Um, I had questions for you, so Sonia and Jenny, um, as a fan and attendee of many of your events. Um, 
I was curious, you know, um, how the Arts and, and Culture Commission can maybe leverage some of the uh, expenses, the budgets, and the success of some of your art-focused tents. Um, I, I know it's something that we can talk about offline, but in terms of, you know, how much you guys budget, um, in terms of trying to come up with our own fiscal budget, uh, f fiscal year budget ahead, um, would love to kind of, I don't know if it's an offline conversation, but to find out, you know, on average, like for the July 4th, now, how much do you guys have to allocate and, you know, what would be a good enough budget if we were the Arts Commission wanted to kind of, you know, partner in or maybe do something uh, on a similar scale um, uh, at, a, at another event, adjacent to another event. So that's my my one question. Um, primarily that. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Carol. So that is something that you can dig down on the city website into the budget, but we're also happy to talk to you offline about that kind of information and see how um, we could possibly partner or in ideas you may have. All right, I don't have anything further to say, just admiration and thank you. My, chi my children have loved all the summer camps um, that you guys have put on and you guys have definitely been very, very busy this year. I'll cede my rest of my time. Okay, thank you. And is there any other community member who want to um, give public comments on this agenda? Please raise your hand. Uh, if no, yeah, we will go back to yeah, commissioner's discussion. So any commissioner want to give some comments of this item. Uh, if, if no, uh, I, I will, yeah, I, I have some comments uh, for this one. Yeah, it's great to see so many good uh, programs this year. So it looks like after the pandemic, yeah, uh, of the city, yeah, everything has come to life again. Uh, and I remember in the past, uh, the staff once mentioned for the uh, Blackberry Farm swimming class, uh, it was hard to recruit, to, yeah, to find some coach or find uh, volunteers or lifeguard. I just want to know this year, do we still have such difficulty or things getting better? So in all honesty, this time it's actually the pandemic that hit us hard. We've had a hard time getting part-time staff back altogether across the board, not just lifeguards. Um, but as our economic email that came out today um, stated, there will be another minimum wage increase in January. And so we will, of course, look at other cities and see how we can be um, in the running to get staff for our summer programs. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Commissioner Stanick. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to comment briefly on the pooch plunge. Uh, I attended it with my dog. She's not a swimmer, but she loves it. And just running around. And I'd just like to um, commend the staff uh, for your flexibility in an expanding the pooch plunge, going from three different uh, time slots to four, expanding from 40 to 50, um, that was really responding to the the interest from our community. And also, uh, you know, I think what it points to is the need or the desire to have more availability of these. So I hope that um, next year we can plan for that, so you're not scrambling and. It, and we can get more community members doing it. So I want to thank you for that and uh, really for all of the programs that you do throughout the year. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the next one is uh, Vice Chair Bigger. Yeah, um, so one of one of the comment uh, that I wanted to make was with regard to the leaders in training. That's an awesome idea that uh, that you guys have come up with. Are you working with the team commission or any of the schools to maybe publicize this? Um, how does it how does it work? Uh, 
Yeah, so actually that program has been around for quite a while and there's a lot of different cities who do the same thing, a lot of different rec departments. Um, some places it's called something different, but um, with our city, we actually, yes, we do reach out to everybody and we get more interest than we even have space for. So that's one where <laughs> we don't need help on that one. <laughs> the teens are definitely very interested and have a lot of fun come being part of that program. And some of them even become rec leaders later. So that's the awesome part about that one. Oh, very good. Very good. I was just not sure. Been a while since my kids were teens, so. Okay. So next is Commissioner Swami. Thank you, Chair Shu. I wanted to reiterate how impressive it is that we have these many activities and the uptake has been uh, significant since the pandemic. So that's absolutely wonderful. One thing that really I wanted to follow up on, on is it's really wonderful that we are going to be increasing the minimum wage in January. Uh, so I, I do think that there'll be a lot of uptake for that going forward as well. So what is the minimum wage going to be raised to? Do we know? Yes, I need to make sure that I don't misquote what it is. It's 17... Mm. Um, 23, I think I saw in the, let's see, I just got the Business Connect. That's another uh, email that you can sign up for, the Business Connect newsletter. Um, and that is actually what just had the That's update. Great. Yeah. Uh, 1720. Okay. And it is raised from what? Oh, I believe it's 1640 right now. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think it is a, it's a great program for at least the teenagers, high school students or other people to take up. And these programs are just uh, phenomenal and very, very good. So thank you all for the work that you do for us. So, oh, uh, is Commissioner Swami, raise your hand again or just? I was trying to lower it. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay, so if there's no more questions, we can go to the next agenda item. So the next one is to talk about the meeting minutes. Okay. Uh, agenda item two, um, that's about the July 14 Parks and Recreation Commission special meeting minutes. So is there anyone have comments or want any amendment for the meeting minutes? Please raise your hand. Okay, if no one have anything, have an issue with it, we can, I, I think we can vote to pass the meeting minute. I can make a motion, uh, Chair, if it is okay. Okay, I second it. Yeah, maybe I'll make a motion formally that I move uh, to approve uh, the July 14, 2022 um, minutes of the Park and Recreation Commission meeting. Good, I second it. All right, Commissioner Swami. I approve. Commissioner Stanek. Yes. Commissioner Kamarapan. Yes. Vice Chair Bigor. Yes. And Chair Shu. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, so the next one is for the September 8th Parks and Recreation uh, and Bike Commission and the Sustainability Commission joint special meeting minutes. Yeah, that was a long meeting talking about the Blackberry Farm. And does anyone have anything to add to the meeting minutes? Okay, I see Commissioner Kumarapan. 
Yeah, so one note is that there were tons of written communication, but in the minutes it says written communication, none. But there were lots and lots of written communication. So I would like to at least highlight the number, like the previous one where it talked about two written communications or something which was included in the packet. Similar update would be helpful because there were lots of written communication towards this particular topic. That's a one comment I want. Yes, Commissioner Kamarapan. Um, under the recommended action, it says that the written communications for written communications for this item were included emails to the Parks and Recreation Commission, Bike Ped, and Sustainability. Because they were related to the item, they went under the actual item versus the written communication section. Okay, got it. Because I just referred to the previous one, and that's where in the previous one on July 14th one, it says written communication specifically under two written communication which were sent to commission. So I maybe it is directly to you. So I just thought it is the same way. But if it is already and if you don't have to, it's okay. We just want to call it out. Okay. Uh, that's the only thing I had. Uh, are there any other comments for the meeting minutes? If no, yeah. Anyone want to make a motion to approve it? Yeah. I can make a motion again, it's okay. <laughs> so I make a motion to approve um, the September 18th, so I'll go back eight, eight. Right? September okay. 8th to 2022 yeah. uh, meeting minutes of the Park and Recreation Commission, Bicycle and Sustainability, the combined commission meeting. I, I second that. that. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can start to vote. Just to confirm, was that team Commissioner Swami or Vice Chair Bengor who seconded? You you can put uh, Vice Chair Bengor as seconding it. That's fine. All right. So we will vote now. Uh, Commissioner Swami. Yes. Commissioner Stanek. Yes. Commissioner Kumarapan. Yes. Vice Chair Bigor. Yes. And Chair Shu. Oh, uh, I, I saw Commissioner Stanek raised her hand. Is there any comments? I, I, I'd just like to make a comment after the vote. I don't want to interrupt this vote. Oh, oh okay. And just lastly, Chair Shu. Uh, yes. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, Commissioner Stanek, yeah, you can speak. Yeah, I apologize, but I just wanted, I don't know how you do this, but it's the point of order or what, but on the minutes for the July 14th meeting, I believe that we all voted. And I believe if the minutes are correct, is it correct that uh, Commissioner Swami was not in attendance at that meeting? If that's true, I believe she should um, abstain from that vote. Just tell me if okay. I'm incorrect about if, that. I don't recall, but if I have not, then I will withdraw my approval. That is, you, you are correct, Commissioner Stanek. Yeah, then please withdraw okay. my approval. Yeah, and make hopefully, it abstain. Yeah. Hopefully, we're reading these minutes that we know what's in them and we remember whether we've been at a meeting or not before we're voting on it. So, I just want to make that comment. So, do we need to vote again? I think my abstaining and pulling out should be fine, right? Unless you need to re approve it. Yeah, I'm asking Jessica or maybe Rochelle if we should just reopen up that item to have a, a new official vote or not, or we can make no amend it. We can make note of okay. Commissioner Swamy's abstainment from voting. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, next is uh, our communication part. Uh, so if any community member, you have anything to say, an unrelated item, so there's any topic not related to any agenda item of tonight's meeting, you can raise your hand and you have three minutes to talk. Uh, is there anyone? Uh, okay, so no one raised your hand for this uh, unrelated 
agenda item, our communication part. Uh, so, uh, are there any written communications we we got? Not for this meeting, Chair Shu. Uh, okay, so we'll just go to the yeah. Next part is a new business uh, agenda item four. That's a Jollyman Park all inclusive playground. Yeah. Hi. Good evening commissioners and members of the public. Give me one second while my team puts on the presentation. Thank you, Jan. So good evening, commissioners and members of the public. This agenda item is to discuss the all-inclusive playground at Jollyman Park. Next slide, please. Jollyman Park is centrally located within Cupertino between De Anza College and CA 85. The project will replace the existing play structure with an all-inclusive playground. Next slide, please. Tonight, among project staff are myself, Evelyn, the project manager, Susan, the CIP manager, and Matt, the director of public works. The design consultant, MIG, is also here. And with that, I hand it over to Melissa from MIG for her introduction. Thank you very much, Evelyn, and good evening. Thank you for uh, having us fax. We can give you an update on Jollyman. Um, my name is Melissa Erickson. I'm a principal with MIG. With me tonight is Jan Eastland, who is also um, a licensed landscape architect and with myself. We are with MIG, a multidisciplinary firm based out of Berkeley. We've been working on inclusive playgrounds for 40 years. Um, and I've written many of the numerous guides behind that process. We've also worked over the years with the US Access Board in developing a variety of standards um, across kind of the nation in addressing accessibility. It's something we take very seriously um, and have a variety of different um, folks who have very technical expertise in the areas about looking at inclusivity in a much broader range. And so with that, we're very excited to, to give you an overview tonight about the developments with Jollyman. As a reminder, in the, the earlier aspects of this project, there were some key project goals that were identified and looking at and addressing improvements in the existing play areas and expansion of those, really taking a look at all ages and all abilities being able to play together and really looking at those intersections, interactions while covering a range of sensory and mobility, um, cognitive communication considerations. And so those are all the driving aspects from um, that kind of has served as a basis for the entire process. We presented to you um, a, several months ago when we were earlier in the process, um, giving you kind of an overview to that process. And what we're gonna do tonight is give you an overview of what has happened in coming up with a more singular vision as we move into construction documents. So tonight, the few items we're gonna be talking about is a brief overview of the design process to make sure everyone is aware of the context for this efforts our more recent community input, which has occurred over the last few months as we've been looking at design refinement, the final design, um, and then going over the next steps. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jan Eason who will walk us through that process. Thank you. Great, thank you, Melissa. And hi, everyone. We're really happy to be here tonight. And I'd like to share how we got to where we are today. Um, we've met with you once and there's been um, other things along the way to share. So. First step, um, after the city had already done a feasibility study and um, achieved the grant that made this possible, um, the first step in the design process was to start site analysis and that started in the winter of 22. And uh, we had to go out to the site, you know, meet with staff, um, just get the lay of the land, do a topographic survey and understand the site constraints and the other recreational uses around the park. That was step one. And then we went in the spring, we went and met with the community in several different um, events to understand their vision for this playground. So we had um, several in-person events at the library and the um, park itself. And then we had a virtual meeting then and an online survey to really develop that vision that would be the basis for our design. And then in the summer, we took that input from the community and came up with two alternative concept plans. And then we met with the community one more time to take um, 
get more feedback on those two designs and find out, was there one they preferred? Was there one um, that was less liked? Or was it a combination of features that they wanted to see in the final design? And once you put pen to paper, you get a lot more feedback. So this is a more, the more fun part of the process, I think. And then that brings us to where we are tonight. Um, we met one more time with the community last night to share the final design. And then we're here with you all tonight to get more comments and feedback from you. And um, so what we wanna to talk to you about is mainly what we heard from the community so far since we saw you last and then share that final concept plan. So over the summer, as I said, we had several events. Um, we had the two pop-up events, the virtual community meeting and an online survey. And in the survey, we got 180 responses. 89% were residents of Cupertino. Uh, over half of those respondents live close enough to walk or wheelchair to the park. And 78% of respondents either had children in their household or they have frequent child visitors, like a grandchild, niece, that type of thing. And 10% of the respondents personally did experience physical, sensory, or cognitive abilities that have limited their use of parks in the past. And from that survey input, we found um, the majority of people did not want to choose a favorite. They wanted the final plan to be based on their favorite elements from each. So it was good that we had survey questions that anticipated that and could draw out what those favorite elements were. So 60% did prefer a combo with 26% choosing concept one and 14% choosing concept two. Interestingly, 100% uh, of in-person participants really liked concept one. And from what we heard from those um, people, uh, there was a lot of concern over concept two, removing the use of the basketball court and taking up that space in the play area. Um, so I think that was one of the main reasons people preferred concept one when they chose it. And then there was also um, the sand play area that was only in concept one. So that seemed to be the top reasoning behind choosing that one. And then for concept two, um, the most favorite element probably of both concepts was the next timer. And so we, um, we heard loud and clear that people wanted to see that in the final plan. And then just a rundown on what those top features were that we heard from the public that wanted to be in this final plan. We heard on the youth side of play features that the top element was net climber, slides and swings, and then followed by shortcuts and scrambles, the multi-kid globe spinner, retreat spaces and music elements. And then for the tots, the top play features were sand play, logs and boulders and the slide, followed by forest house swings, turf mounds and music elements. So those aren't, I, there were a few other elements on the list, but those are kind of like the upper tier and the middle tier right there. So we knew that these were the top features that we wanted to include in the final. So next we, we took all that input and then we also took a hard look at the construction budget for a reality check and um, came up with this final preferred plan that um, really made it, made a, the community's input as the goal of what to include in it. And here is the final plan we developed. It's similar, similarly to the two alternatives, the theme is um, nature exploration. And it's really designed to offer a variety of challenging play opportunities, uh, child-driven exploration. It's meant to encourage cooperative play opportunities and also provide some spaces for solo play and for retreat for those kids who want to take a break from the action. And we don't feel that every single feature needs to speak to every kid at every moment in their development. But what the goal is, is really to provide a range of experiences. There might be times in a kid's life that they want one element versus another. There's times where um, they favor one type of play over another. And so it's really important to provide these things that kids can grow into and it's not just a kind of a one hit wonder that you graduate from at age six. 
So this slide is a overview of the inspiration images that go with the plan, but we're gonna go into each area and go through the images that go with that area so you can kind of get a closer look at what's happening here. So before we get to the first feature, let's just take a look at the plan, overall plan here. And at the top, um, you can see um, the little circle with the P1 is the main entry. And what we have already going for us here is we have the Stelling Road parking lot on the left side and we'll be creating, um, it, it has accessible parking and we'll be creating a path from that to the entry up here, which is a nice close access for people. And along that path, you'll see the dashed um, square. That is something that came about at the beginning of this project in the winter as a need um, for there to be a close, accessible, inclusive restroom. So the city staff kind of flew into action and have they've secured funding for that. And that's gonna be, now that's just kind of, that part of the process is just starting and we're gonna roll those two processes together so they can be constructed simultaneously. So if you follow that path and you you enter right at the circle there at the top of the top of the plan, um, you'll see that there's a perimeter fence and a gate. So that'll provide some enclosure and safety for. We know that some kids um, tend to be runners, and this will provide safety for them and their parents. And then there's that central path down kind of the center of the plan that um, just organizes the site and it's kind of this clear access point where you can find all the elements off of it. And then at the lower end of that central path is another gate to the south so that there's two ways in and out. Okay, so that's kind of the basics of the plan, just orienting you, but let's get into the actual fun play features. So the first feature you see in that yellow highlighted circle, that's slide mountain area and it includes multiple slides and multiple ways up and down. There's a roller slide and a wide slide and tube slides. There's an accessible path up. There's a stairway with railings for kids and adult sizes to go up. And there's also scrambles and rope pulls to get up. So that's kind of a fun um, interactive, just a lot of opportunities, a lot of choices for what to do on the slide mountain. And there's also um, the safety surfacing for that area is turf. So that's another opportunity for kids to slide. You can slide down on your own or you can use cardboard as a popular way to do that. So the next element for the youth age is the lookout. So this is a way, this is the net climber and we call it the lookout because you can get up really high. Um, which is fun and it offers a really range of challenge. If you're a little bit more timid, you can stay down, down at the bottom and still have fun. But then as you grow and develop, you can um, challenge yourself to get to the top. And the other elements here, um, off to the side, you'll see a little circle that's a nature retreat. And that is a place where you can pull off and be, you can either do pretend play there or you can be kind of off to the side and um, seeing the action, but not being in the middle of it if you're, if you're feeling overwhelmed by it. And then also next to the net climber are two lighter benches. So that's a nice thing for all ages where you can just um, have a grandparent and child or child who maybe doesn't feel like being in the action. You can just kind of sway there and enjoy your day. Next in the youth area, we have made um, what we call the discovery trail. And this is a wheelchair accessible path to reach the top of Slide Mountain, but we've tried to make it more than just a path. So it has things along the way that make you wanna go there, whether or not you need it to go up to Slide Mountain or not. Um, you can see the first yellow circle at the lower end of the plan um, is where the nest swings are. And those are a nice uh, cooperative place when you can go alone, but you can also go with grandparent and child or two kids and it's just a nice, um, offers a lot of options for different ages and different abilities. And you can also lay down or sit up. There's a lot of, lot of options. And then as you head up that path towards Slide Mountain, you'll see there's a vine tunnel. So that's a nice sensory experience to go under the vines. And then all along that, we'll be doing more special planting that has more texture and color. So it it's, provides this opportunity for play with the plants. That's something we always integrate into all of our play areas. 
And then as you go halfway up, you can see the circle on the left side here. That's a music stop. So there's chimes and drums. And then as you continue up, you'll see there's some shortcuts, uh, a rock scramble here, and then you make it up to the top of Slide Mountain. And then the next, I think this is the final slide for the youth play. You can see up, um, up here is the multi-kid globe spinner. And that is a element that caters to many, many kids of different ages. It's meant for age five to 12, but I've seen you know, younger and I've seen adults and it can be a lot of fun. You can find a safe spot in the middle to ride on it, or you can be a daredevil on the outside. And it also is at a transfer height. So if you wanna transfer from a wheelchair, that's an option as well. And then next to th that over here, this other yellow circle is the swings and we'll have two belt swings. You can see on the left picture of the swings and then on the right, you see the picture of the molded accessible seats. There'll be two of those as well. And that's for children who have more of a need for support. Okay, and then next we have a couple slides on the top play area. So here we have the first circle on the plan is the belts, uh, the bucket swings for tots. You can see that in the left picture. And then we have what we call, this whole area we call the Jolly Woods because it has some existing big trees. We're planting more trees and it has these forest paths that weave through and some even more kind of secret paths that go through with stones. And then you find your way to the forest house here, which is a structure that offers multiple things and not a huge footprint. It has sliding, it has climbing, it has some pretend play. And then there's a couple little turf hills that you can roll around on that you can see in this picture. And then the last thing in the top area is the sandbar. And that is this area down here. It has a raised sand table for somebody to wheel up to it if they need to. And then it also has a bigger sand area that you can transfer to down these boulders that you can see here, you can transfer into the sand area. And then there's also a dry creek play area along here that encourages kids to explore. And then this is the last slide. I've been uh, taking a lot of time here, but we're getting close. And um, this is just to go over a couple of the overall site features. You can see in the orange or yellow circles here that this is the gathering grove. And this is centrally located so that you can hang out here as a caregiver, you can hang out here as a kid who wants to take some time out, but you can still be kind of close, you know, on the edge of the action. You could have bring your lunch or you can just um, have a place to have your stroller and all your stuff and plop down. And that is also has a lot of planting in it so that there's shade. And we are planning to have picnic and game tables. And then the last thing on this slide is just wanting to point out that we always think that planting is a key play element in any park. It's natural, it's fun, it's exploratory. It is something that is kid driven, you know, they can find their own way of enjoying and taking interest in it. And so we've really made an effort to um, not just have a sea of safety surfacing and really integrate the planting into the plan so that's providing lots of little pockets for shade trees and just places to play with plants for play. Okay, so we, um, as we said, we did talk to the community last night. We didn't have a huge turnout, but we did get some good comments. Um, so I wanted to report to you what we heard. We had some good questions about equipment just, you know, how it's used, what it is, questions about dogs in the play area, they, they won't be allowed. They are allowed outside the play area on leashes, and then there's an off-leash dog area nearby. And then just questions on, you know, what kinds of plants. And then we had people liking the planting and shade options. And then we also had a few ideas about more things to include. One idea was to add more benches near the sand area we have log benches, but you know, some more benches with backs for um, more support. And then there was also a suggestion of adding a nonverbal communication board, which we all thought was a good idea. So we're 
we're also, you know, beholden to the budget, but we're trying to fit those things in as well. And then to let you know what's next, we're gonna hear from you what your comments are right after this. And then soon after we will begin CDs construction documents and we'll draw this up. We expect construction to be in 2023. And then we expect the grand reopening of the playground to be in 2024. So with that, I've been talking forever. I will pass it back to Evelyn or Minna. Yes, if any commissioners or members of the public would like to ask questions or provide comments, now's the time. Okay, so are there any clarification question? I, I see the vice chair, Bigor, Christy. Yeah, you can ask. Okay, um, so thank you for your wonderful presentation. I really wish I could go back in time. This seems like a fantastic place to be playing on. <laughs> Um, but uh, just just as a quick question, um, did I hear that you said you had some budget estimates, um, or am I, am I imagining that? Yes, we have a budget. We've estimated it, and this fits in the budget. Okay, um, and I, I did I miss it? As I mean, I saw how much money we have for this, and we're like right in there the 3.6 is that where we are or is it is it a different estimate yes so we have a total budget of 3.6 million and that includes the design and construction and any other um, consultants that we may need for the project the construction budget itself is 2.9 million i see And do we have any idea of what the design? No. You have a design. Uh, can you, yeah. Yes. Can you? Yeah. So MIG is our design consultant. Right, right. So you have a design and you think your construction budget is 2.9. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. The next one is. Commissioner Kumar Pan, can I ask you a question? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, for commissioners, so she's one I by her, so it's, it's mentioned for all ages. So I, I assume that I can go play too. So I don't have to go back in time because that's the first thing they said for all ages. So that's the one I'm starting. I've noted down here anyway. A um, couple of, I mean, maybe three or four questions. Number one, you talked about the um, 180 responses on the survey. Is it the previous one you put in there, the same survey, I believe, right? It's not a new survey. These 180 responses. Is it a new survey? Or I do remember that in the last meeting also you presented a survey. Correct. So the initial outreach had a survey, which was the visioning survey. And then we released the second one. And the second one had 180 respondents. Oh, okay, thank you. So that's the one. And you said that you also did a lot of pop-up events. Can you tell me like how many people showed up in an average in the pop-up events? So we had two pop-up events. The first one was at the library, and that one had a great turnout. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Jan, was it between 50 to 75 people? I think that sounds right, yeah. Yes, and then the second event was at Jollyman Park. That one had a little bit less foot traffic, so I'm, I'm, I think it was about thirty people that came to our booth. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, do you have? I know since based on the community input, you said that you combined on the new plan. You shared it. Do you plan to do one more survey just to let them know? Do you want to inform those people? Who took it? Is there any action? Because they, res they asked you and you're responding it. Is there a plan to communicate back to them? Yes, we acted on it on the combined plan because if the construction starts, if they don't know anything, I'm trying to see is there any communication going back to the community that this is what? Yes, so I have, we have posted on the Engage Cupertino website the final concept. And if members of the public are registered, um, they get notification of when things go up. And that's the way we are going to communicate the final plan. And we okay. did share with them last night as well in a 
public virtual meeting. Awesome. And the last question, this is all related to the safety because I, I never been to these um, all-inclusive playground. So for me, uh, if, if these are all a very basic question, Gopal, but I just wanted to all related to the safety measures. Number one, we, you show the slides and typically as sometime I experience that the slides in summer will be very hot on the slide. Um, and is there, a, is there a specific material there or how is it going to be protected in the summer? Again, all of the safety based questions. I'll go one by one. So slides, what is the approach? Did you say answer one by one? I wasn't sure if you were. Yeah, yeah, if you could answer one by one, I have <laughs> okay. two more areas. So. Um, we do plan to have shade cells there. We didn't draw them in just for clarity, but, um, and then we've also oriented them to the northeast, north and northeast to limit the direct, you know, south sun. But we also have shade cells included in the budget. Okay, awesome. And the second part is the, um, you call net climber, but you said lookout, right? That's also if the kids, again, if they fall from their kind of, I know the material on the bottom is like uh, turf, so I think it should be okay, believe, but is there any safety, based on your experience, is there any safety concerns which you already have included the protection for those in case of the kids climb and then fall? We have, we include the safety surfacing that's the right, um, it's varying depths based on how high the fall is. It's not designed to prevent every single problem, but it's kind of designed to prevent the biggest kind of head injury type problems. That's what the safety manufacturers um, are designing for. But I think the net climber itself lends itself to be safer than other things because it's pyramidal. And so it's kind of hard to fall from the top um, tallest might get tangled or somewhere. Because I, I, there's I a lot of things to hang on to on the way. Okay. And the third area I looked at is the, the like kind of a creek kind of, we put in there with the boulders, big boulders kind of. Um, is it kids are allowed to walk inside? Um, small stream or something then you put in there. I didn't know exactly what it is called. It was by the sand area. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, by the sand area, the big bowls. Uh, bowls yeah, the that's designed to invite kids in. It's dry. It's just a, um, um, a place where they can kind of play like they are in a stream, but there's not water in it. Okay, but so that, again, based on your experience, it's not a safety concern because big boulders, they might trip on it kind of, they don't, you don't see any uh, safety Major issues you have seen it so far in your forty plus years. Yeah, it's all pretty low down. It's it's okay. reasonable in the. Yeah, in the so maybe just to summarize all of the, do we have any safety boxes and stuff in there? Did they get bruises and stuff? First aid boxes, kind of, will it be available? Because I haven't seen that specifically called out. Maybe there, because all these things are, in case of a damp since it's a purple area, do we have safety? first aid boxes installed there for use? I don't typically see those in city parks. Um, it would have to be something that was really monitored and replenished all the time. I don't know if okay. uh, has an answer for that otherwise. Yeah, but just specifically on this particular, because it comes with uh, people with the different abilities. So they, they, may, they may be under supervision, but still they are on their own will compared to others, so I, there is a chances that if they get hurt or whatever, how do we, how do the parents or how do the, the caretakers respond to it and what is the way it is and is there anything this particular park amenity provides or the city, just again, based on my safety concerns, I may be. If I may answer that, um, I'm Susan Michael, I'm the CIP manager. And um, I think in some ways that's an operational question. If there was to be a first aid box nearby or something like that, um, it wouldn't be uh, in the MIG's realm, so to speak. Um, but it is worth noting that the bathroom will be adjacent to the new playground that we're putting that in, and it will be a large facility uh, so that it, we can have what we call adult, adult ass assistive uh, so that you can have adult adult changing table and things like that. So um, that will be an, a very good resource for the caregivers uh, in that instance. Okay, thank you. That's all my question. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. 
And I see you know, Vice Chair Begor have more questions. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, th one concern I have is that whole sand area and how do we keep it clean? Um, stray cats have fun there. Uh, how? What is your experience has been the issue, uh, issue if there was any, or how do you maintain the cleanliness of that thing? It's another operational question, I guess, but anyone who can answer. I think Melissa's gonna say I, I'll go for that one. Um, that always comes up. I will say it is a, a classic question. It really depends on the neighborhood. There are in many cases more concerns about it than it actually being a problem, but that again, totally depends on the area. Um, the play value for the loose parts play that sand provides as far as its manipulability, the fact that it's free form, really kind of outrages a lot of those concerns. Now, if it becomes an issue, then that's gonna be something we'll have to take a look at as far as maintenance considerations. But in general, it, it really has not been a problem in the places we've had it in. And in some places we've had it in place for over 20 years. And you know, it's more about sand migrating and that being more of a maintenance concern. So taking a look at where you can sweep to bring sand back into the area and a replenishment. But the issue of cat waste, um, hypodermic needles, those types of things have, have chosen to be not as high as people had thought, as long as it's used, that there's eyes on the park. And that's really the main thing, which giving the public that sense of ownership and designing it based on the comments that they've had helps kind of build that too. Um, but we have not seen that those have been issues in, in other places. We also met with the maintenance staff there and they were really a great team. It sounded like they kept the park, from what we heard from people and from them, that it was a, a, a great place and that people have done a good job of keeping it clean in general. Okay. And they're on the scene pretty often. Yeah, we have maintenance staff there regular, regularly taking out trash and cleaning up. So we'll keep an eye on that and see if we adjust our cleaning schedule, if that does come to fruition. Okay. Uh, I have one follow-on question for what Gopal was asking. Those boulders, are they really natural boulders that are going to be there? Or are they like more of a paper mash kind of boulders. I mean, something smaller children can, young children get on. Um, I'm not, I don't know what the material is. I'm just, I'm just, you know, giving an example. Are they really hard rocks or? Most of them are real maybe. boulders. Um, at the slide area, we have a choice of either doing kind of like a, um, you know, sort of like a gunite molded kind of thing or mm -hmm. boulders so i think we have to price those two things out to make sure which ones can work out best okay i, I mean i think from a safety perspective i think a, a real boulder versus um you know man-made softer material will probably be safer for the kids or, although i don't know the prices of these things so i have no idea what to expect i'd like to say there isn't much difference in, in the actual hardness, whether it's glass reinforced concrete versus granite, it's more about the edges and the shapes of the stone. Um, but that value of real material is, is also kind of a key piece to get to the sensory quality of what that does as far as folks' interaction with the areas. It has to do more with the heights too, but that will be part of the factoring and actually selection of the actual boulders that are used. Mm -hmm. And they've never, um, from your experience, they've never been any, I'm mean, not never, but uh, what is the <laughs> probability or ha ha how much, how many times have there been issues at these type of playgrounds? I mean, do we have any stats on that stuff? No, I don't know of any, any stats. If it's a specific type of play equipment just, or play areas or which aspect of it? Um, just the whole, you know, there are so many things that are different from a typical playground where you have a small slide and a couple of steps yeah. that you go up. <laughs> well, we like to think that this this should be the standard, um, you know, for is the range of opportunities and, and the range of abilities that can engage in the space. Um, this is actually fairly, um, not typical, but these components are things we use all the time and I've been using for 20 years in different aspects and that's the part that gives the richness so that there's surprises. There's something new every time you come, mm -hmm. you get some seasonality. Um, but is it any more dangerous than any playground? It's probably safer. There's more things to do. 
um, their surprise, um, and people will stay longer with that mix, which is also part of the goal. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Of course. I should mention that towards the end, once construction is complete, there will be a certified um, play inspector that will measure fall height distances and ensure that the playground is ready and, um, and available to open to the public. Okay. And uh, I have some questions regarding the lookout uh, structure. So uh, it said that's for use but for some teenagers, they are as high and the weight is almost as an adult. I just want to make sure so that a net climber that can hold the weight of an adult. Is that right? Yes. Because it's all inclusive. Yes, yes. We oh. hope adults will be on it. That would be great. In fact, I would like you all to get on it at some point. I think that would be a great commissioner photo. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, and I remember I saw it in the... Uh, by the Elizabeth Lake in Fremont, they have a very high lookout. Yeah, they didn't call it all inclusive play structure, but they do have some some feature that's yeah for all the age, all, all kinds of people. Uh, yeah, good to see Cupertino will have such playground. And, and I have a question regarding the funding. I remember in the past uh, we said we we are short of funds. We need to do some uh, community. Uh, fundraising and maybe we need to build a donor wall uh, but now looks like the the problem solved yeah that is, <laughs> yeah that's correct so um city staff did hire a fundraising consultant and through collaboration with um the consultant we were able to acquire a million dollar grant from the state from assembly member evan lowe's office so we have um we are now fully funded for the project. Okay, good to know. Yeah, because I, I know some friends with special need kids living in Santa Clara and uh, Sunnyvale. Uh, yeah, they are doing some community fundraising and they ask around for, they are for friends to donate. Good to know <laughs> our city already solved this problem. <laughs> yeah, we did um, very efficiently with one large donation. So we're very glad to move this forward um, and Thank you. Okay, good to know. Uh, okay, Commissioner Swami, you can ask your question. Thank you, Commissioner Chair Chu. I have a question uh, with this additional budget of $1 million that you have. Are we in excess or did we meet the needs exactly? And if we are in excess of the budget, then what are we doing with that? Are there any additional enhancements? So with the um, state allocation, the grant budget, um, we are meeting. We are at um, meeting our goals. We, right. There is no excess. So we were um, hoping for external funding to come through, which was the Santa Clara County uh, grant funds, and then the one million dollar fundraising goal. We eliminated the fundraising goal by getting the grant. I see. All right. Um, all right. Thank you. Okay. So if there's no more questions, we just go to the public comments uh, section. Uh, community members, if you have any comments regarding the all-inclusive playground at Jollyman Park, please raise your hand. Uh, and uh, now I see three people raised hand. Okay, each of you have three minutes to talk. First one, uh, Susan Moore. Hi, so I just want to thank you all for a really wonderful project here. I, the staff, the consultant, uh, the co uh, commission. Um, and I, 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 the one concern I had about this site was the bathroom, which was way over on the other side. And to get the funding and to actually have that in the plan and to have all this wonderful, uh, these wonderful plans, I really feel this will be a great, great uh, project. Uh, as a senior, I can bring my grandchildren. I might even be able to climb that net thing. I don't know. If, it, if you do it like next year or, or year, I might be able to do it, but please don't extend it 
because I won't be able to. Anyway, it sounds beautiful. And at, with that bathroom, um, uh, it, it's great. So thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next one is Carol Ma. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I wanted to say congratulations. I saw that big check being presented on, what is it, Wednesday's meeting, and I was like, woo we can get an extra slide in or something. So um, congratulations, and it really feels great to have someone like um, you guys, Mig, um, to kind of ask the questions that you guys are experts on. Um, so I'm really excited to see where it's, it's come along since the summertime. Um, I have two or three primary points um, that I want to kind of cover. Um, uh, one was about how the community feedback has been solicited since the initial phases. I think the past two rounds, they've been all mostly in the evenings. And um, I'm, I have some real concern over whether or not there isn't complete transparency over respondents who are people who actually have children 100% of the time within that target age range of this playground. Um, you know, and the respondents, you guys have kind of bucketed together with people who have children versus children who visit. And I think that there's a there's a discernible difference in um, the community that needs to be served and dependent on what group is being asked that question. So there's some concern over uh, the feedback um, in terms of whether or not they truly are successful in engaging parents of that age. Um, not necessarily saying that it's not the citizens' responsibilities to be engaged, but to say that I wish that there was a little bit more transparency in parsing that out separately, because I do think the interests are divergent. Um, the second thing, and this is related, related to Sash, Shashi's question, um, as a parent who's had to uh, multiple times ask people to leave with their pets on school grounds during school hours, um, I do have some real concerns in terms of uh, gating and both for health and sanitary um, reasons, sanitation reasons, but um, is there gating around the entire playground periphery, or just like they do have at Kevin Moran's? I think that's number one. Um, and then two, related to that is, what other learnings have you guys gained from the other area playgrounds in terms of how the citizens in this area do things a little bit differently, where you know the staff is amazing um, in keeping the parks clean, but in really kind of making it absolutely crystal clear that the playground is not for open play for your pets to go off leash. Um, um, th that is like, I think that is the biggest concern I have. Um, and also to see what other learnings you have from other playgrounds, because there is something very uniquely different about our community and their willingness to comply with signage. So there is, there will be a perimeter fence around the entire play area with two entrance points. Um, we are, we are not allowing any pets on the play area except for maybe uh, service animals that are in serving children or people with certain disabilities but for the most part there will be no pets allowed okay well and and then um i don't know if you can hear me but the last the last portion just on the arts um, aspect is if there's any opportunities i know that there's a lot of material discussions but in terms of opportunities of uh, space or uh, ways that the Arts Commission can work with the little local artist community to kind of create more natural murals or bring in local artists to, to make the spaces a little bit more uh, representative of our, of our community. So that was the last piece. I think there's definitely opportunity for that and we would welcome it. Mm -hmm. Would you agree, Evelyn? Yes there is potential opportunity also for the restroom and possibly a mural, but uh, we can discuss that offline. And we did actually, your first question about the transparency of who had children, we did have that in the survey. I just don't have a number in front of me, but I feel like it was around 50 something, like 56% had kids. And then there was like another 20 that were the people who had visitors. We just put them together and the, to abbreviate. Okay. So the next speaker is uh, Yuko Shima. Hi, everyone. I have about five questions. How many cars can park to access the park? 
Are there parking lots? And how many entrances are there to access the parking lots? Yes, so we do, we do have a parking lot um, off Stelling Road. Um, there are a, approximately three um, accessible spaces, and I'm, I'm going to say about 20, 25 um, open spaces. I would have to verify that number. Thank you so much. And are there any um, bike racks inside of the park so that... Um, Teenagers could go there after school or on weekends to enjoy the park, and they may want to bike park their bike somewhere. Are there any bike racks inside of the park or outside of the park? So we are um, we are going to incorporate. Can we, can we let the speaker ask oh. all her questions? Sure. So because she is being timed. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think it would be good to, to let her get through all her questions and then address them. I don't know if we need to reset the timer or what. Yeah, yeah it's okay. Mm -hmm. And um, Jerryman Park is a huge park, um, just about more than 10 acre of land. I think it's, it could be a good idea to utilize some solar panels to create clean energy out of this area and get it connected to the grid. And I think that it's beneficial putting po uh, solar panels on the roof for the car parking lot and also for the bike rack area if it's safe to do so or on the roof of the bathrooms that can be available. Wherever it could be, um, land could be used for a good purpose. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, yes, so we are incorporating um, bike racks into the adjacent to the play area, and we will note the comment for solar, solar panels. Okay, so um, if there's no more uh, community members want to speak, we can start the discussion um, among commissioners. So anyone have any comments for this agenda? Okay, uh, Commissioner Kumar Pan. Yeah, the comments or maybe I would like to see that I think you put the next steps, which are good and 2023 construction starts all of them in a high level. Uh, but do we have a detail? We'll be publishing the detailed uh, plans on, okay, the plans will be when are the stages and the phases, I believe, um, when that would be available, um, all the phases of it. Maybe I know it's a question to MIG team or our team, Suzanne. So when we will see the detailed one, the phased one, until it gets open 2023. It's one year plan only, right? So looks like it starts in 2023, gets completed in one year, opening in 2024. When we'll have the detailed phased implementation plan will be available for the public to see it. Um, so to um, reiterate your question, you're, you're asking when you will see the detailed plans to the park? Yeah, it's detailed implementation plan. I know it looks like it'll happen in 2023 and it'll be open. I know that I saw the three lines in the next mm -hmm. steps. I know it's a high level. It's okay, we don't have to, but I'd love to see the phased approach of, okay, when we plan to do the first phase or we're going to just do a card off the entire area for one year and then one fine morning we'll open it. I do not know. So it'll be good to see uh, because some of these the community members made comments, right, on request some questions. I like to see how it is progressing it, and it'll be good to have more transparency on what is the plan, what stage, when will happen, three months from now, six months from now, and how I think I hope you will be updating us in general through this commission to the public, the progress or any uh, bottlenecks or anything you faced, kind of, I think it will be good to see it, the progress, so it will be good to see 
are we making progress as we planned? It looks like a lot of expectation, excitement in the in the community to see this one. We just want to, this is just to make sure that we support and we just monitor and help. Okay. And that will be available. Okay, noted. So uh, you want to see some sort of schedule with the phases of the project. So including design, design completion, bid, construction, and the different phases of construction. So more yeah, mainly the construction, the design and the bit and stuff. I think that's all city staff. You will take care of it and the timing. Yeah. Or, I, that's not main, but at least once the construction starts, when will happen, what, when will happen, kind of. So. Okay, I can I can make note of that and um, provide something more detailed on the Engage Cupertino website. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a one comment for now, but I'll leave it to the other commissioners to chime in. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, actually, I have uh, some related questions. Uh, so, like the community member uh, asked about the uh, restroom location, uh, and staff said, yeah, we can discuss it later. So, in which phase this, uh, this thing has to be, uh, so there's a, there should be some, some de deadline. So in, in which phase the bathroom location have to be determined? Yeah, I'm also wondering. So you are um, asking for the location of the restroom or when it will be um, de constructed and open to the public? Uh, I, I'm, I want to know because now the community members said, yeah, maybe the location is too far away. I just want to know in the next year at, at uh, what time this, uh, this location will be determined and will let the commissioner know and maybe you can present it in public meeting. Is there any chance? Uh, I don't want it since be like going to a black box only after everything built, we, we know the location of the restroom. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we do know the location of the restroom. Um, it was in the plans closer to um, the parking lot near the entrance, the northern entrance of the play area. Um, and we'll, Jan will be sharing the location. And we are concurrently designing the restroom with the play area, and we will um, be constructing both concurrently. And could, sorry, could you see my cursor there when I was pointing to it? Okay. Have my ink on. We can see it. Okay. So. Uh, the next one is uh, Commissioner Stenick. Yeah, you can ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, I think I, I just want to commend um, staff and the consultants and for coordinating all of this and getting so many ideas into the plan. Um, the one question I have, and it, it's a little bit of a concern, has to do with um, there's the musical area and to me, I would think that an inclusive playground where we're going to have um, people with various sensitivities to audio, um, I would think would, I, I love the chimes. They're very, I, ex I expect they'll be very soothing. I have a concern about the drums because I'm concerned that drums can be very triggering to people with audio sensory sensitivities. And so um, I was wondering why we're doing drums there, and are there places that are quiet, quiet spaces that actually block out noise for those um, individuals that have that kind of sensitivity? Melissa? Melissa? <laughs> yeah, so that, you're right. Sound is one of those things that some people need that to help them focus and others have a very hard time because that gives them too much sensory overload. So one of the, the, the key points in looking at its location was to have it be off onto the side so that one, it's not closer to the residences so that, that there's less of a concern there, but then also that it is off a path and kind of away from some of the other higher active areas. So it can be a little bit more focalized on their space from others. Granted playgrounds, tend to be loud. Um, 
we hope that there's lots of giggling and laughing and, and conversations, but specifically for the tonal qualities, that was one of the key reasons I'm locating it where it was so that it could kind of be its own space and that folks could then kind of also be able to be away from it if that was not what they were looking for. But we'll also be looking at planting and some other things to try and provide some additional um, support and buffer as that's being looked at. Thank you. Yeah, I would hope there'd be some muting opportunities for that. I mean, musical instruments um, can be very soothing, but again, drums themselves. I I've been to lots of inclusive playgrounds. I've never seen drums. So um, I'm just wondering if, if that, how critical that is to the success of this design. Okay, so yeah, if no further discussion for this topic, yeah, Commissioner Swami, you can ask your question. Yes, thank you very much. I, the whole plan uh, is uh, looks amazing, and it's also great to know that we have adequate funding. I want to actually just follow up on one thing. What is the his What is the historical way in which the city holds the contractors accountable to a timeline? Sorry, excuse me. So is there a way in which, for example, uh, if there is there is a delay, is there some kind of uh, an accountability uh, that we put in place? Um, or, or we just kind of trust that any uh, delays, so to speak, in the timeline um, is, is just what we expect it to be and roll with the punches. So what has been the historical thought process and how? what have we learned from the past and what do we intend to do in the future? So your question is related to the con construction contractor yes. and the schedules right. there yeah. and the delays. So typically in construction contracts, there are um, things stated, uh, certain terms like liquid liquidated damages. So if a contractor goes beyond the time schedule that was agreed upon, there are um, sort of issued fees that they need to pay, which are liquidated damages. Mm -hmm. And the city is able to adjust those to what is the appropriate amount. Um, and just general construction management overseeing the project, making sure that the contractor is meeting their uh, milestones. There's regular mm -hmm. communication with all the with the contractor and their mm -hmm. subs, ensuring that they are um, ordering all the equipment on time and and hope hope hoping that it's um, no scheduled delays there. There are some manufacturers that we need to um, just keep an eye close eye on. There are some delivery issues with certain but we are um, just keeping track of the schedule um, and keeping constant communication with them. That's actually fabulous to hear, um, knowing that you have these checks and balances in place. Thank you very much. Is this standard practice or is this something that the city of Cupertino has implemented more recently? Um, typically, it's a standard practice. So the California contract code um, and our mm -hmm. public contract code um, enables us to be able to have those checks and balances. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Commissioner Kumar Pan, have more questions? Yeah, I think one more question which just comes in. Um, maybe it's a question for uh, Melissa or Jan and uh, uh, Jane. So when we, based on your experience, when we really roll out this part, when people come and do it. And if you find something, which is definitely, again, I'm sorry, I'm maybe like safety concern with the kids specifically. I work with a lot of little kids, so I'm just trying to. Is there any places where you see that, okay, this is implemented in a way, but I think it is either abstracting or you see more of this and then you need to redesign. Have you been any of those? Because it's just on trying to see when they try it, and then sometimes it, it, you think that, oh my God, we all thought it, but it's not. Then we need to re relocate that particular one or anything. Have you ever seen it? Or you think that so far in your experience, all implemented, we never had a chance to redesign in some pieces of it? Just, just a question. 
Sure. Um, I would say that we haven't had that experience on anything that has been built, but that is why doing a really thoroughly vetted design process is really key. Looking at the adjacencies, the fall zones, the sight lines, the connectivity, looking at the circulation, you know, and trying to take a look at making sure that the sight lines are, are clear, um, but providing that variety. So safety is obviously a key aspect. There's a wide range of code and regulations that we're all beholden to to address for, for children's um, environments. And again, we're looking at all ages and all abilities. So that is a, a key aspect. Um, relocating something once it's installed is not an easy thing because of you know the foundations, the footings, um, what's happening as far as the ground plane, the safety surfacing, et cetera. So, that's why we spend a, a great deal of care in getting the concept really kind of dialed in and then all the construction documents and continue to look through those aspects is really critical for that success. Um, I would say we have a good track record, um, but it is all about really making sure we do due diligence. Yeah, no, I trust your uh, your abilities and your uh, expertise in it, but just a question on, typically we do trial and error in some area and, and then if it's not working, we will do it, but just based on your experience, looks like, that could be a very corner case if at all, but uh, yeah, just just a question. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, so uh, is there any other question or discussion? Okay, so uh, I have something to say for this uh, playground. Uh, and first of all, I'm glad to see yeah, we are going to start the program and don't need to wait for another round of uh, community fundraise. Yeah, and it's a good news. And, and I just remember, uh, so several years ago, um, we had a debate um, to talk about if we just um, uh, build the magical bridge uh, playground or we build our own. And at that, that time, the conclusion is we design our own all-inclusive playground because the budget can be lower. And uh, I remember some council members, they also mentioned we can save the money uh, because uh, we have we, we may have some other project at uh, Memorial Park and maybe we can put some uh, elements with some uh, uh, feature like the all-inclusive uh, feature, but it doesn't need to be the whole playground is all inclusive, but we can put something yeah, for all age and more yeah, uh, accommodating to yeah, people with disability, with sensory issue, all kinds of that. Yeah, and good to see uh, this will happen. Yeah, and thank you all for your hard work. Well, I do appreciate. <laughs> okay, so I'm finished this agenda item. So next one is talking about uh, reschedule the November Parks and Recreation Commission meeting. Yes, so sorry everyone, but I will not be available the first week of November for our meeting. Um, it's been a little over eight months since I've taken a vacation, so I'm taking a vacation, <laughs> sorry. So if it's possible, if we could, thank you, <laughs> Commissioner Stanek, thank you. Um, if it's possible, if we could actually uh, reschedule that meeting in November, we do still want to have it, but um, we're hoping you all maybe have calendar availability on the 17th. Is that a yes? <laughs> uh, I have a question. So in the past, uh, we said if we want to reschedule a meeting because for the public notice, we didn't put a specific date on our current agenda. So in this meeting, we can only um, decide to reschedule, but maybe we need some public notice about a specific date later. Well, we will still have to, of course, notice no matter what date we choose, but we are trying to get your calendars while you're all together. So if that date is possible, then, of course, we will do all of the notice about that date and the change of schedule. Okay. Yeah. So I, yeah. I might might be remote, but uh, not on vacation, but work, but I think, Rachel, how, how can you take a vacation after eight months? No, I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. So... You should, please. And if we can help you, whatever way it is. And yeah, 17th, 
I might uh, be able to. Uh, I'm traveling on that week uh, to New York, so I, I might be able to put in a remote. It's okay. It'll be like midnight, and I will switch off my uh, video, so you don't want me to, because it'll be really starting at midnight. I mean, 10 o'clock, and it'll go. I don't know how far it will go. But I'll make it available. Thank you. So that's two. Yeah. So no, well, I could be available that day. Oh, good for me. I unfortunately will have to get back because that is the time when we have annual events at workplace. We have three of them, and I don't have the the dates at the top of my head. Okay. So at this time, we do have a quorum. So if it's possible for a motion, you do need to please add to your motion that you are canceling the regular meeting. And then having the special meeting moved to the 17th. Okay. So we, we need someone to make a motion to reschedule. Should we do it? I can make a motion. I can make a motion to cancel the regularly scheduled meeting the first Thursday in November and to reschedule it for November 17th. I, I just have a question before we vote on that. I thought. So I second it, and then I think we can go for a discussion, I think. Right? So I second that motion. Sure. Um, I just, ha I did I misunderstand this, that we have to only talk about canceling now? <laughs> Do we have to finalize the date is the question, I think. Mm -hmm. It is agendized to reschedule, so we can talk about rescheduling it, but we did have a quorum of people saying that the 17th was all right. If you would like to wait, we can do it via email if that is better for everybody. I would uh, recommend waiting if possible through and doing it via email because I most definitely want to attend and I am I just don't know off the top of my head if I can and I really want to. But it's up to you. If you guys have a quorum and you want to settle on the 17th, then you have the majority to doing that. I will have to I will have to abstain right now. Okay, but um, so I, I think for the motion, we can still vote for the motion because the motion is only for canceling and we are right. going to reschedule. And that, yeah, okay. and I can second and I can support that. Yes. Sorry, can but I? My I motion was to cancel and to reschedule. Yeah, it's a com combined one. Right. So. That's why. That's why I asked the question. So, if, if someone Split. would like to make a friendly amendment to to not to just do the cancel part, I mean, then we're going to have to come back to all of this um, through no, email. We can do that in email, right? So we can. So I can make a motion that says we. You can amend the motion. Yeah, we can cancel. You can make a friendly amendment. amendment. Sorry. What was that, Carol? Yeah, you, you can amend the motion. Okay, I'll, then I amend the motion <laughs> to state that we will cancel the meeting in November and we will reschedule it sometime in November. I second that. Is that right? It's fine if that's the way you would like to do it. Okay. Just know that we don't have yeah. a whole lot of opportunity in November, so fingers crossed that Commissioner <laughs> Swami can yeah. make it. <laughs> yeah. My only concern about doing that is, you know, we have the public and we have it being recorded here right now. And so that's why I, I would prefer to let it be known that we're going to be what the date is that we're going forward with, because otherwise the public won't know until it actually gets noticed. So I guess we can take a, a vote you. on the, the amended motion. Maybe a question, Rachel. So once we check through the email, when you will notify, you only have 72 hours before they will know, when the public will know when the next meeting is. After we cancel it. I'll let Jessica answer that since she sends out all our notices. Yes, so as soon as everyone replies with whether or not they're able to make it, um, then after that, I will add it into um, the calendar and it'll appear on our um, meeting agendas and the meeting minutes on the web page. But, typ but typically when we cancel a meeting, you always send out a notice saying it's canceled this time and this is going to happen. So it will be at least a week before. 
Correct. It's usually at least 72 hours in advance prior to the meeting. To the regular meeting for the cancellation. To the regular notice. meeting, yes. Yeah, yeah, for the cancellation notice. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask, Rochelle, um, how long will you be gone? Um, I'll be back the next week in, in November, so that okay. is Monday. The only slot of Was there a particular is reason that you pushed it out two weeks instead of just doing one week? Um, because depending on what's on the agenda, everything will be due and I have to have time to go through it all and approve it and get it posted and sent before we can have our meeting. So I'm happy to look at other dates that are a little closer. It'll just make my Monday crazy, but that's okay if that's what works better for people. I would yeah, certainly no, appreciate it. Because I, and I say this because um, I normally I would be very very amenable to completely uh saying yes and every other any other month i could this month uh, on the month of november i i'm not certain we have at workplace round the clock uh annual event where i have to be available every hour so that's why i really don't know the dates and therefore i cannot commit to november 17th yeah I think uh, we can should i go ask by the mr email. swami when will you know when will you know I will know tomorrow or day after and within a week. So let's do that oh. by email is my uh, sincere request. Okay, I think we have a friendly amended motion to cancel it. Yeah. Thank you. Jessica, do, do we have a second on that, a motion? I believe um, Commissioner Kamarapan, I think, seconded it. Okay. And we're good to take our vote. Okay. All right, Commissioner Swami. Uh, uh, I agree, yes. Vice Chair, did, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I'm not, we're, we're, we're voting on the amended motion, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, sorry. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Stanek. Fine, yes. Commissioner Kamarapan? Yes. Vice Chair Bagor? Yes. And Chair Shu? Uh, yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so do we still want to take some time to discuss the date today or? We no, just, we'll, we oh, will go ahead and do that through email so that yeah. Commissioner Swami can look at her calendar. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next agenda item. Okay, that's the last one, uh, monthly update. I'll go ahead and let the commissioners go first and I will go at the end. Okay, is there any commissioner have update or, okay, uh, I see Commissioner Stanek, you are the first. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> I attended the Pooch Plunge, which was um, very well attended and well managed and very popular. Um, I also attended the Silicon Valley Day and Night Fun Fest, um, which had was in a different location this year because of the construction of Memorial Park. And um, I think that went very well. I'd also like to say that I attended the uh, council meeting where they were discussing the community grant um, update and the subcommittee um, progress and their comments. And it's my understanding um, that the subcommittee of um, council member Moore and vice mayor um, Liang Chow have um, one of the suggestions was that they discuss with the commission, uh, with our commission, our now commissioners, what our thoughts are on the community grant program. And so I really encourage that. And I'm delighted to see that Council Member Moore is, is sitting in on our, our meeting tonight. And I look forward to talking to her about um, the community grant program. Okay, 
So next one is uh, Commissioner Kumar Pan. Yeah, so I got it to, um, thanks to report one, I did go finally to the dollar in jo Jollyman a couple of weeks back and just want to play and to see that how things are. Uh, it was fantastic. I have so many furry friends now, my friends, I can call it. Um, as part of the discussion, uh, uh, at least many of them were approached when I introduced myself as a commissioner and and I'm just here to see and how things are. And they uh, put some requests and I sent it as a written communication. I think Jessica, Rachel, you have it, but at least for others uh, benefit. Um, they were asked, they were talking about the benches. It will be good to have the benches on the side, on the other side of the wall, because they are playing, but they are standing there and they wanted to see, um, will we have any benches uh, in future? And I know sometimes like we talked about in one of the things, there will be benches, but I, I said, I do, I know there was a plan, but I do not know exactly. That's where I directed, uh, asked them to send me an email and I sent it to you, Rachel, and, and stuff. So I think there was a lot, many people were asking. They were just standing there and say, they said, we are standing here for an hour. Is there a way we can just sit and relax too? That's one. Number two, uh, they did uh, bring it up, uh, uh, key issue there, the water fountains, um, in, for the docks, they need to go and fix the water, which is on the right side and of the park or the extreme side of it. When they walk to there, the furry friends follow them. So they go out of the, 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 the Dola area. So they were asking, is there a way they can, they can provide a water fountain near the fencing on the other side, near the benches, so that they can go and fetch water for them? Because they said it's a practical issue. Uh, because they just, the doggies follow them and they, they have to go to the, the exchange side on the other side to fetch it. So they brought these two practical things and say, these are the things and uh, it will be good if I can take it up. And then I said, yeah, I will take their concern and then bring it to you all. So that's what I send those. Um, I asked them to send an email. So those two, but it's a valid one. But there are lots of people, fun, joy, and I felt so good about it. So that's the one. Of course, I did attend the volunteer fair last weekend. Um, it was fantastic, excellent work by the staff and every booth, and there were lots of interest um, on it. Maybe our booth was kind of a dry, they don't know. I, I wish next time onwards we can put some real park kind of on a thing on it, so at least it attracts people to come and see that on the commission table. We were just having booklets and paper, and they felt, okay, this is boring. They just walked around. Uh, but I think uh, it was fantastic, and I had an opportunity to do some workout um, uh, in that chair. So it, it was fantastic. So thank you for all the staff, especially Park and Rec, and you, your tables were really great, and other things were. So thank you. Those are the updates. OK, thank you. Uh, and Vice Chair Bigor. Man, today, Gopal, you're talking, you're thinking, I mean, you're saying everything I wanted to say. So I also, I mean, I happened to be in the library at the time of the Bubatina, then I saw the other stuff, but the volunteer fair was something I wanted to specifically say to Rochelle that was very well done. Thank you for you guys for doing that on a Saturday, taking extra time to do that. That was very nice of you. It was very well organized. And just like Gopal said, nobody came to our table. We were practically begging them. <laughs> like, you want to know more about commissions? But <laughs> but it was very well organized, well received. Thank you. OK. Thank you all for your update. If there's no more, yeah, our director. Go ahead and give my update. Um, so first of all, thank you to all of you who were able to come out to the volunteer fair. I did see three of you there and it was great. Um, maybe next time we need to come up with some fun getaway, a giveaway so that they come to our table or some flashy sign like some of the booths had um, or a Photoshop photo opportunity. We, we can come up with something, don't worry. Um, but I did want to let you guys know, council did approve remote teleconference meetings through November 3rd. And so depending on when our November meeting is, we'll let you know if that continues to get pushed out. Um, we also began a pickleball trial this past Monday. Yes, <laughs> we got there. So um, there are dedicated pickleball times um, on court two at Memorial Park. Uh, right now, there is not an end date for the trial only because I'd like to see how the weather goes through the winter, because if it's not great weather, it's not a great time to have a trial because people won't be playing. 
Um, however, there is signage posted. There is a website, cupertino.org backslash pickleball with all the information. There is also pickleball at cupertino.org if you would like to email any questions, concerns, or anything about the trial. So um, we're very excited for that. Pickleball is a fast growing sport that people are very interested in. Um, so feel free to either email me if you have any questions or go ahead and check out the website to see when those dedicated times are. I'm also very excited to say that the Historical Society agreement with the city and the Historical Society was approved on Tuesday. Thanks so much to council for that. Um, I think we did a pretty good job putting together um, something that works for both parties. And so we'll see how it goes. But for you guys, what that means is they will be coming and sharing their annual plan with you to allow for public comment and public interest and some input. So we will be sure to figure out the best time of year for that and then go ahead and put that on the agenda um, once a year. Maybe more if they have more fun things to share with us. Um, beyond that, we do have our revitalized Memorial Park, the Memorial Park specific plan pop up that will be at Diwali on Saturday. Um, and then their community uh, survey for that closes on Sunday, the 9th. So be sure to go to Engage Cupertino or continue to spread the word on that so that people fill out that survey. That one is from Memorial Park. Um, now for Lawrence Mitty, because we do seem to have some great CIPs going for parks these days. Um, the second community survey is now open. This survey allows the community members to provide input on the three design concepts, which came from the previous survey. Um, this survey is open through Halloween. October 31st. Mm -hmm. um, there will also be a pop-up at the Cupertino Library on October 8th. So on Diwali Day, they will be, Memorial Park will be at Diwali and Lawrence Mitty will be at the library. And then there will be a drop-in site visit on Saturday, <laughs> October 15th from 10 a.m. to noon. So if you haven't gotten to see that site and kind of see what it looks like, that would be a great opportunity if you're around. Um, and then there will be a virtual community meeting on Monday, October 17th from 6 to 7 p.m. And of course, all of this information is on the Engage Cupertino page. So feel free to head over there and make sure if this is something you're interested in, please put your email in the stay informed box. And that's all I have for you tonight. Okay. Oh, oh, I, I see Commissioner Kumar Pan. Yeah, I have a quick question to Rachel. So when you said that the the um, meetings are approved until number third, and in case if, if we go beyond, do you see that there could be an in person? The reason I ask is I'll be traveling on 17th or whatever the day fixed after. If at all, how do we attend it? You will have a mixed one or just if it is in person that there's no Zoom at all, correct? I don't foresee this ending for November, but it's not approved right now. So we okay. have to be open for anything that could happen. <laughs> okay. Just, just, just to want to make sure. I don't want to miss it, but in case if it is, they approve it, then I, I think we, it'll be difficult. But that's we'll only be, question. we'll be sure to work with you on on if we have options for something like that, depending on if there's a change. Okay, thank you. Uh, so regarding this question, I, I remember our council meeting. They, they, they can do the hybrid meeting for the council member. So that means maybe some member in person and some can still join the meeting on Zoom. And I remember our Vice Mayor Liang Chao sent email to all the commissioners and she said maybe such setting is more convenient for commission meeting. And so any commissioner, if you are interested in this, uh, yeah, um, to maybe you, we, you should send email to city manager and to your director to ask if uh, the city staff can help the commissioner to set up like the council meeting. Yeah, looks so, like maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll wait and see what's actually approved. And then of course, we'll wait and see what the direction is for commissions. But yes, if there are possibilities, we will 100% work with you on that. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So no more discussion. Okay, now it's uh, wow, only four past nine, so early. <laughs> oh, there is one more item I see. Huh? One more item. 
Sorry. Attendance for next meeting. Huh? Right? Commissioner attendance at upcoming meetings and events. Yes. That oh, is yes. Another. All right. So we do need um, someone to attend next week. Um, so we, we actually don't have anyone for October yet. So it's next Wednesday. Oh, I see Vice Chair Bigor would like to volunteer. Uh, the mayor's meeting, right? Yeah. Yes, the mayor's meeting. Okay. And so is, for a four, for four months. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we can swap places, Commissioner Vice Chair Bigor, that would be great. Okay, that's fine with me. <laughs> so I can go next Wednesday and you can take November. Sure, no problem. All right. Okay, so Commissioner Swami will do next Wednesday, October 12th, and then Vice Chair Bigor will do Wednesday, November 9th. Okay. And do we have anyone who would like to volunteer for December? That's December 14th. Uh, I can do that. I would volunteer. I, I, I haven't done it for a while, so I'd be happy to, okay. to do that. Sure. I don't think I've done it since early in the year. Oh, you can take my spot too then. <laughs> 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 well, it's okay. I don't think I want to do it the day after the election. <laughs> All right. In December. Let's see if there is a meeting on, in November. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. So, Luke's, yeah, we are all set today. And thank you, everyone. Uh, and now it's uh, six past nine, and I call the Cupertino Park and the Recreation Commission meeting end for today. And thank great. you. Have a good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great vacation, Michelle. Thank yeah, you. Enjoy, enjoy it. <laughs>